The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. He cares about this almost as much as he does Florida and New York. We're taking nothing for granted in Nevada, and we benefit from the last few years of real investing in the Democratic Party infrastructure. Tonight on Politics Now, with less than 100 days until the November election, we dig into the presidential race here in Nevada. Plus... I do think the board is divided, and it's unfortunate. CCSD Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara keeps his job. The contentious board meeting that shows just how divided trustees are. And... It's alarming, because if this is happening, what else is happening? Nevada's employment office is not providing details on the fraud they say is widespread. The I-Team went digging for answers. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. Nevada's second special legislative session is now underway. Thank you for joining us. I'm John Langler. A second meeting of the Nevada legislature started on Friday morning. The governor says this session will last until next Friday, the 7th. On the agenda, criminal and social justice reform, including use of force and police liability. Voting in the November election, how will that go forward, including in-person and polling locations? That'll be discussed. Changing rules so people can get paid unemployment benefits and evictions, all on the agenda. Another potentially contentious measure would address COVID-19 liability protections for schools and businesses. The general election, meanwhile, is 100 days away, less than that now. So with that in mind, we wanted to dig into some of the races. President Donald Trump held campaign rallies in Texas on Wednesday. He touted his energy policy. The president has rolled back regulations. He's expanded export opportunities, he says, and granted four pipeline permits, including one that he says will send Texas crude oil to Mexico. As long as I'm your president, we will never let anyone put American energy out of business. For the first time in nearly 70 years, we have become a net energy exporter. On the coronavirus, President Trump says there could be a vaccine by the end of the year. Nevada Republican Party Chairman Michael McDonald is the main surrogate for President Donald Trump here in Nevada. I spoke with him about the race. We saw an ad just go out from... Uh, uh, Vice President Biden this morning, I believe it is. Uh, haven't heard a whole lot from uh, Mr. Biden recently. How has Mr. Biden's campaign affected how the Trump campaign is trying to get its own message out to the public? I think it's, it's if you look at the, you know, first of all, it's nice to see Joe Biden actually come out. Uh, we, at least we know who we're running against uh, with, with the Vice President. President. But when you look at it, it's also where he stands. Uh, you know, his commercials also show the contrast between the president, who has built the, the greatest economy we've ever known in, in, in the history of America, and we're going to do it again because of the coronavirus. But more importantly, it's a law and order, uh, you know, where Joe Biden stands with people. It's been hard for President Trump to have uh, his, his rallies. He had a couple of them, obviously, but uh, circumstances are making that challenging. We know it's happening with the convention as well. What, how detrimental is that to um, your efforts? You know, I think when you look at it, what we've built here, uh, we have the, the largest ground game we've ever assembled in the in history of the state of Nevada. Uh, we're, we're one on one with the RNC. We're one on one with the Trump campaign. So we've been blessed to have uh, in, in our state the messaging that's been able to go out. We have the strong leadership from the Trump campaign and from the RNC. Our chairwoman has been very, very supportive. So what that allows us to do is obviously uh, we'd love to have the big rallies. I mean, that's something that the president's ph phenomenal at and he's great at. There's no one better. But more importantly, the one-on-one -on -one contacts, you know, we've had 1.5 million uh, voter contacts in this state and we're growing. Why not incorporate or try and get uh, Congress to go through some police reforms now? What's the, what's the holdup? Well, you know, I think they're, they're trying to work hand in hand, but also the Democrats, if you give them an inch, you know, they, they want to do away with policing all the way around. Uh, you've seen where some Democrats just say, look, we want to defund the police, we want to move forward. 
So there's no balance where the minute the, the president is able to start talking and working with the police unions and working with police officers and police sheriffs, Jasons, and say, look, we need to move forward on some type of reform. The Democrats immediately go right to, we need to defund the police. So there has to be some type of common ground. They've, they've done it time and time again against this president where he tries to reach across the aisle and he gets beaten with the olive branch. How is the president going to make sure that Americans don't, get forced out of their houses, don't lose all their money, don't lose everything. Uh, and especially here in Nevada, where we're kind of on a razor's edge right now. Very much so. I'm glad you brought it up. We, we practice, uh, we practice the, uh, the mask. Uh, I lost a friend uh, a couple weeks ago, personally, a very close friend of mine that passed away from the coronavirus. So it's taken very seriously. Uh, when you look at it from where we're sitting right now, it's, it's very difficult because we've had such corruption inside the, the, the funds that came in here with the unemployment which was staggering, uh, that the people came in and took advantage of it uh, for people that really need it. When you look at what the president's able to try to provide, where we have some type of, I hate to say stimulus, but it is a stimulus, uh, that's not under corruption, that's not under uh, examples where people take the money but don't need it. Uh, so it, it's, it's something where I know he cares about Nevada more, I, I hate to say this, but he cares about this almost as much as he does Florida or New York or where he lives. He's been very, very bullish about Nevada. He loves Nevada. All right, so we have that full interview with Michael McDonald, available for you at 8newsnow.com. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden is expected to pick his choice for vice president any day now. On Tuesday, an Associated Press photographer caught this image of the former vice president's notes. And they mentioned California Senator Kamala Harris with lines like, do not hold grudges and great respect for her. During a campaign event this week, Biden detailed how his economic recovery plan would address racial inequalities. My Build Back Better plan would make sure families in these communities are the ones who benefit from the hundreds of billions of dollars in federal investment. Biden's plan would set aside $30 billion for a small business opportunity fund, and it would help Asian, Black, Latino, and Native American business owners. The plan aims to have at least 15% of federal contract spending on goods and services with minority-owned firms. Well, the senior advisor to the Biden campaign here in Nevada is State Senator Ivana Kinsella. I asked her about the campaign so far. Speaking of uh, former Vice President Biden, um, where is he? <laughs> I don't think he's been here since the, uh, the, uh, the primary, or since the caucus, I should say. Um, are you concerned about the attacks on, on where he's been and the allegations that he is in hiding? So the vice president has taken medical recommendations really seriously as to the need to social distance, to quarantine, and to follow best medical practices. So he's largely been in his home in Delaware and has taken regional trips. But that doesn't mean that he's stopped working hard. In fact, the vice president has said that he has been working harder now than he, uh, than he did previously because he is glued to his screen and making sure that he's communicating with voters as much as possible. So let's talk about the coronavirus. Um, pure and simple, from the Biden campaign's point of view, what is President Trump doing wrong and what would a President Biden do differently? Joe Biden has taken a very public position. He would have treated this very differently. First, he would have never discarded the pandemic as something that will just magically disappear like President Trump did. He wouldn't have allowed for there to be such a decentralized response like President Trump has. Joe Biden would have ensured that from day one, there was leadership coming out of the federal level so that states weren't forced to fight against each other for things like PPE and forced to compete in a global market for equipment like ventilators and masks and testing supplies. Uh, what we've seen at every step of the pandemic is an epic failure coming from the federal government. And what Joe Biden would do differently is not only based on his policies, but also on the way he would make sure that Americans felt like there was leadership coming out of Washington, that there was a plan to not only answer the public health crisis, but the ensuing economic crisis and really give folks a sense of leadership. Uh, I know that's not quantifiable, but it would make a tremendous difference at a time when Americans across the country are feeling epic fear and uncertainty. The issue of federal authorities in several cities, sort of the, the way these protests 
certainly not everywhere, but in, in, in a couple of cities have manifest themselves in uh, violence and some clashes. Uh, would a Biden presidency support putting federal agents in cities to deal with protesters in, these manner, in this manner? Yeah, thus far, we've seen the Biden campaign stand up and say, not only is that unacceptable, it's an unnecessary response to what have been peaceful protests. And we can use our neighbors in Portland as a prime example where there have been protests of moms, protests of veterans who have come to stand up for what is a very, very special moment in our country to speak to the deep racism that permeates all aspects of policy making, but particularly in policing and criminal justice. And you can watch the full interview we had with State Senator Kinsella on 8newsnow.com. All right, coming up next here on Politics Now, fraud in the unemployment system. They had to have had my, my social security number and knew where I work. The I-team's Vanessa Murphy digs into how much fraud we know about and who's looking into it. Plus, the now wife of congressional candidate Dan Rodimer has had the police call on him twice back in 2018. We have the details next on Paul. From El Pollo Loco. Welcome back to Politics Now. Clark County School Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara is keeping his job. After a contentious board meeting this week, Dr. Jara now says he wants to focus on education. But as Kristen Drummond explains, trustee criticism over his performance remains. Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara says he's here and staying focused on students, a statement he's continually made despite the recent drama with trustees who remain at odds with one another. That this was an unbelievably calculated move. I do think the board is divided and it's unfortunate. Concerns following Wednesday's special meeting. Go, you you set you set up. Trustee Danielle Ford questions how to move forward following an abrupt adjournment. She called for the meeting along with trustees Linda Cavazos and Linda Young to address Dr. Jara's leadership and possibly firing him, but... I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. They finished without a vote on Dr. Jara's contract and division among the board. So how do you suggest you guys come together? I don't have an answer for that. Uncertainty now about unifying the group, and it may not happen soon since Trustee Ford tells me she plans to continue pursuing the matter. This is not the end. At some point, you beat a dead horse, and I think that it, it needs to be done. 
Dr. Jara deciding not to comment on the drama, but focus on the district. He released this letter Thursday and writes, I am not a politician, I am an educator. The superintendent addresses challenges, adversity, and fighting for students, a viewpoint trustees claim to share. I think there's going to have to be some healing that's going to have to happen here. Dr. Jara says the district will succeed if everyone comes together. In the newsroom, Kristen Drummond, 8 News Now. Trustee Ford says her focus on the superintendent directly relates to students and to schools. She says she wants to hold him accountable so they best serve the community. We'll follow that also as it moves forward. Meanwhile, a Nevada judge has ordered several thousand unemployed workers to finally get their benefit checks, but still tens of thousands of others are waiting. Now, the ruling stems from a lawsuit filed by out of work freelance and gig workers against the state for pandemic unemployment assistance in the program called PUA. Dieter says, Dieter told the court rather, 30,000 PUA claims were pending, 22,000 of those flagged as fraud. State officials say 3,000 of those claims were actually eligible and were ordered to get paid on Monday. As for everyone else, the judge says he wants to see more progress. The court continues to be concerned that the progress, however, under the circumstances that people find themselves in here in Nevada, uh, are moving uh, too slowly. So what happens next? A special investigator appointed by the court will update the judge on what progress has been made by Dieter in two weeks. Now, as you just heard in that lawsuit, unemployment fraud here in Nevada, it is a major problem. While many Nevadans really need that benefit money right now, fraudsters in some cases are stealing it. Dieter is releasing few details, though, about this major problem, so the I-team's Vanessa Murphy went looking for answers. My operations director opened the mail and it was a filed unemployment application with my name on it. This is the document Debbie Ritchie received. She's the CEO of Body Spa Group. Did you ever file for unemployment this year? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's my company. She says she didn't receive unemployment money either. They had to have had my, my social security number and knew where I work. She called the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation, or Dieter, to report fraud. Ring, 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 ring. She says she hasn't been able to reach anyone. It's alarming because if this is happening, what else is happening? The I-team reached out to Dieter, and a spokeswoman said fraud can be reported on the website, claims will be investigated by staff, and Dieter may or may not follow up to get more information. Richie's director of operations for the Salon Group describes the website as confusing. It's crazy. I don't know what's happening. Uh, Nothing's making sense anymore. So how many unemployment claims are believed to be fraudulent? In a letter asking the U.S. Inspector General for an investigation into Dieter, Republican state leaders wrote that Dieter recently reported up to 185,000 possibly fraudulent jobless claims, costing the state millions of taxpayer dollars. When the I-team asked Dieter and the governor's office for more information, details were not provided. So so we reached out to local communities because while information is being stolen from workers at private businesses like Richie's, public employee info is also being stolen. Clark County reports 203 employees victimized. The city of Las Vegas reports 50 fraudulent claims. Henderson reports 100 for March alone. North Las Vegas reports 74 and Boulder City 45. The I-team has also learned information has been stolen from at least 17 Metro employees. It just seems like there's no control anymore of, of anything. Richie says she contacted the credit bureaus and she's keeping a close eye on her bank accounts. Our number one concern is to stay safe, but second, with all the fraud going on, it's just you really got to pay attention to what you get in the mail. Vanessa Murphy, 8 News Now. 
So there is a task force for COVID-19 related crimes like unemployment fraud, but sources told the I-Team there is some confusion among agencies about who actually investigates these claims. For example, Metro Police has no access to Dieter Systems. Their investigators have been provided the number of fraudulent claims. We do know Metro's digital forensic investigators are working through Dieter with Dieter through to investigate Metro employee fraud, but that's just Metro. At 8 News Now, we do have some information for you at watching at home on how to prevent identity theft. Just go over to 8newsnow.com. Next on Politics Now, a new plan for coronavirus. Governor Steve Sisolak says he plans to dump the phase approach, what he plans to unveil next week instead. Plus Monday on Good Day Las Vegas. You're watching Politics Now. Let's take a look now at the race for Congressional District 3. First, this week we have learned that the now wife of Republican Congressional candidate Dan Rodimer called police on him twice in 2018. Neither of the calls led to arrests or charges against Rodimer. The former professional wrestler is running against Democratic Congresswoman Susie Lee for her Congressional District 3 seat. One of the calls was a domestic violence accusation. In a police report, Metro police officers said it seemed to be an argument. Months later, the woman involved, Sarah Duffy, called 911 again to report Rodimer had stolen cash, jewelry, and some guns. My ex-boyfriend entered my home and stole about $200,000 worth of jewelry. How long ago? And um, 30 minutes. Okay. Were you home when this happened? No, but he sent me photographs. Okay. What's his name? Daniel Rodheimer. The police also recommended that she try and solve the call, the second call, civilly as well. Rodheimer's campaign called the first call a verbal dispute and said the couple is now happily married with a baby on the way. They already have five children. As for the second call alleging a robbery, Rodheimer's campaign says no items ever left the house and they were just moved to a different location. Again, Rodheimer was not charged at all. The Nevada Democratic Party sent out a press release, though, calling the 911 calls disqualifying. Meanwhile, Republicans are focusing on the husband of Congresswoman Susie Lee. He received a loan from the Paycheck Protection Program. Lee and the rest of the Nevada congressional delegation lobbied to reverse a rule, excluding gaming companies from getting those loans. Two weeks after that rule was reversed, Full House Resorts, the company owned and operated by Lee's husband, got a $5.6 million loan. Our Washington, D.C. bureau correspondent, Alexandra Limon, asked Lee if that was a conflict of interest. 
The fact of the matter is there was some bureaucrat in Washington who made a decision to exclude gaming based on some 20-year-old guidance. I was doing my job. I was standing up for the interests of my state. And I'll let you know that now we have seen over 40,000 businesses in Nevada uh, taking care of over half a million employees. So to me, uh, there was no conflict of interest. I was doing my job. And the interest was in the interest of my state. Lee says she was not involved in the company's decision to apply for that loan, her husband's company, or the Small Business Administration's decision to award it to them. Changes to DACA, the program that lets children brought into this country by their parents illegally, uh, but lets the country illegally by their parents stay here. That is DACA. Homeland Security announced it is no longer accepting new applications for the program. It is also making renewals for one year instead of two. Each application costs $500.